anyway, so ooh, let me bring up my notes so we can get moving. Um, um, so did anyone have any issues finding wines from the Southern Rome? Nope. nope. Okay, great. Total Wine and More had like a whole section. I was like, this is exactly <laughs> what I'm looking for. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I think like the whites can be a little more challenging to find, um, but I'm glad to really sit and kind of hone in on this region because it's 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 a very it's a small region, but it's like massive when it comes to it comes to wine. I mean, there's 20 different grapes that are grown. Um, throughout just the Southern Rome. And that's all we're talking about today. We're not talking about the Northern Rome. So that's really compelling. 97% um, of the grapes that are grown in the Southern Rome are red. Um, so that's why it's a little harder to find white Rome wines. I mean, you, you can certainly find them and um, they're glorious, but I think it's, 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 it's amazing. And it also speaks to their terroir and it's a, it's a very Mediterranean climate. It's a very warm climate. And so a lot of times these Southern Rome grapes do really well in that region. Um, also in that region we have, um, there's 17 crews that are um, in that region. So I've said the word crew before, and just to remind you all, what that basically means is, just to put it in easy context, is that it's like the winemakers have to fight, and not fight, or they have to apply basically to the government in order to, for their region to get established as a crew. And so the crew means sort of like the best of the best region. And the Southern Rhone has 17. And I'm not gonna talk about all 17 tonight. I sort of um, gonna talk about the most important or the most popular, and then just kind of dabble on some others where you can find some really outstanding values when you go shopping or when you're looking at a wine list. Um, so just one thing I want to say, so those of you that have been following me and joining me on these like every week, thank you. One little pro tip, um, if you don't want to uh, sit down and take notes, I know some of you do, um, I'm now incorporating some slides and things that you can take like a screenshot of. And if you really, really want to learn more about wine, this is how I really got uh, better at it and um, is creating flashcards. Um, so just buy little flashcards and you could just put down, you know, what the question could be, what are the red grapes of the Southern Road? And then, you know, on the other side, you list those grapes and you just go through them. And that's also how I um, learned um, how to do foreign languages. So, um, Anyway, sorry, I'm getting distracted reading some of the comments. Um, so I'm leaving tonight, like everybody's, um, I'm not muting anyone. You can mute yourself if you want, because I, I want you to be able to, to like, you know, raise your hand if you have a question, you know, stop me if I'm going too fast. Um, you know, I want to, this to just be as like interactive as possible and sort of what I do when I'm out at a live event and people come up to me at my tastings and they want to learn more. So, um, you know. I feel like that's a good tool. Um, so anyway, so we'll dive into the grapes. Um, so those of you that were on my uh, Grenache call, um, Grenache is the leading red grape of the Southern Rome. That's what it's all about. We'll at one point get into the Northern Rome and that's all about a different grape. So Grenache, again, to repeat, is the leading grape. Followed by, we have some blending grapes. Syrah, Mouved, Senso, Carignan, Pounwa. I'm um, not gonna trouble you with all of those, but just I'm gonna highlight a few um, that are the most important, I should say. So what do they do to independently and when, when they marry together? Because the Southern Rhone is all about like blends. Um, again, with Grenache being the, the forefront. So Grenache um, does great in hot weather. Jimmy, I believe like in, um, 
in Texas that they do grow some Grenache. I know in Southern California, we grow Grenache. I know in Baja, they grow Grenache. Um, but when you look at, will you throw up the slide real quick on um, France so we can get a uh, visual of where we are? Also, just, oh, so just a note, I'm actually drinking an a la Cante, which is a Sicilian name for the grape that is Grenache in Sicily. Exactly. So here we are. So just like, this is what I love about this now. So having this map, because, well, okay, we all know where France is. Um, this, if you want to really check out a website, it's called winefolly.com. I gave them the photo credit. They have awesome maps. You can buy the maps or you can do what I see Becky's doing, take a little screenshot. You know, that's what I do. I have my little play-by-play, -play, like flashcard things in my phone. Um, this map is awesome. And, um, you can dial down into the Rhone Valley which we see is in the southern part of France. And it's the dark pink region. And so that's where I'm gonna be talking about uh, the southern end. And um, so it gets very, very warm there, if not hot. And the next slide is the more specific, this is all the southern road. So we just took that little chunk and here's the regions that I'm mostly going to focus on this evening. Um, this, this map, I don't even know who made it, made it, but I could not give like props to, to them. <laughs> um, we'll go on to the next slide real quick. This is the soils. So this is Grenache on the vine here. And like, that's what the soil type looks predominantly. We have all different soil types that are out throughout the Rhone, but this is the most famous um, when, when people talk about what makes the terroir so new, unique. Um, it's Galais is the name, and they're these ancient riverbed rocks that have just been, because they've just been, when you think about like tumbling rocks or whatever, if you're into rock tumbling, they get super smooth. Um, the vines here are, are short. They're not like when, if you've been to Napa or other wine, like California wine regions, where the, the, the vines are much taller, um, that's not the case here. They're much more in some areas, uh, they're like bush vines. Um, and if you dial in, if you could take your cursor and look at the trunk, the tree trunk, if you will, of this vine, you can see how big it is and how gnarly it sort of is. That is an older vine. And older vines, especially with Grenache, give wine in the Rhone Valley some insane character. And sometimes on bottles, you'll see it listed, as I wrote here in French, via vine. So that just means older vines. So you can dial out of that uh, slide. And I'll talk about um, the other grapes. So what do they all, all do when they come together and play? So Grenache really provides... Just really quickly. We'll, we'll, when we do the recording, we'll include the slides. So, yeah, great. You know, yeah, so you don't yeah. have to write all this down. It'll all be there. Yeah, yeah, you take, yeah, at the, yeah, exactly. So, um, and then, and then this recording, just so you know, will be posted to my website. So like, if you want to go back and like visit, you can click on that particular, like I'll call it a curriculum, you know, so you can, it'll be dated and it'll be listed exactly how you got like the email. Um, so again, so the grape, so red grapes, uh, we talked about, I talked about Grenache, you know, that provides um, fruit and aromatics and it does really well in, in, in when it gets hot. Uh, Syrah is the second most blending grape and that provides muscle, color, alcohol, and structure. And uh, so it looks like we have someone did, okay, you got them joining, perfect. Um, and then the other most popular blending grape is Mouved. And uh, Mouved also provides color and structure. So it's interesting to see what's happening in California. Mouvedre is starting to be just done on its own. And it's just very inky, grapey kind of color. You don't see that in France. 
Um, so as far as moving on, uh, sorry, hi, Liam. Um, the white grapes that are in the Southern Rhone, and who here has a white Rhone? Yay! It's not poured yet, but I, ha I have it inside. Oh, okay, awesome. Well, cheers to everybody. So whatever you may be drinking, um, you know, I've got two, so feel free to taste as you please. There's no organized format as you need to drink the white now, you need to drink the red now, you know, ha have fun with it. Um, so Grenache Blanc is one of the main grapes, and yes, it's related to uh, Grenache. Um, it provides like a softer fruit structure as well as alcohol, and again, it does really well in warm, dry climates. Uh, Roussan is one of my absolute favorite white grape varietals ever. Um, it provides power, structure, and aromatics. And then Viognier also provides mm -hmm. aromatics and structure. And in California, we do see Roussan by itself as well as Viognier by itself, which one day, you know, maybe we'll do like a class on, on those independently. Um, other white grapes that you see, and they're mostly like blend ending grapes, and that's why I'm not going to spend too much time on them, Bourbon Blanc, Picable Blanc, and Claret, and I'll have this at the end of the slide, so you can, again, just take a screenshot, or you can revisit my website to, to get that. Um, so the picture I showed, you know, the soils there are mostly rocks, um, but we also have sand, we have limestone, and we have clay, which most people don't really talk about, you know, they want to talk about the famous rocks. Um, the other influence that you get, which is really cool, is um, Garrigue, and I mentioned this when we talked about Grenache, and Garrigue is a French term which is very Mediterranean that talks about um, the different like tarragon and rosemary and all these different, um, and some of the, the wood that is, or trees, I'm sorry, that are grown there, that really encompass this intense aromatic. Um, if you go shopping in the spot, spice section sometimes they have that uh what is it called like the, the french um god i don't i can't remember the name because i barely use it but it's herbs, like, herbs de provence herbs de provence that's basically <laughs> thank you <laughs> um so those are some of the things when you'll find like as you're as you're smelling and tasting your wines is that they're really aromatic and they just don't smell like fruit you know, you get a lot of herbal characteristics in them, which I just find, this is just one of my favorite regions to, to talk about because I find the wines to be so complex and, but yet so giving, and they have just so many different layers. Um, so any questions before we dive into the regions? All right, if you wanna share uh, what you're drinking, you can drop it in the comments. Um, I have a, uh, this is actually interesting wine here. This is um, a Cote de Rome Blanc that is actually 100% Grenache Blanc. Normally you see yeah. them um, with blends, but um, this isn't. And a lot of them also, as a side note, um, have, are organic if not a lot of them are also biodynamic so uh really easy in this area to farm organically and i'll get into the re reasons why that is so the first region that i'll start with um probably what maybe a lot of you have tonight coke de rhone does it just say coke de rhone on your bottle i think jimmy had a question did you have a question jimmy yeah. well she may be getting this i was gonna say I know that as we, what I've learned is we get into some of these regions and stuff that it doesn't necessarily say what the grape is. As long as I'm looking at this, is there a way to know, is it just as a matter of knowing where the region is and by knowing the region, you'll know the grape? Exactly. So plural when it comes to the Rhone is primarily plural. So you're going to have like multiple grapes. Because gotcha. um, as I mentioned, like 20 different grapes are grown throughout the Southern Rhone. But <laughs> Grenache Rouge, when you're drinking the red, is going to, it should be, and I'll talk about this as I go along, the primary grape. Um, traditionally, that's what the Southern Rhone is about. Northern Rhone, uh, which we'll get into one, one other time, is about Syrah. So I just don't want to, to confuse you at all with, with anything as we go along. And, and so sometimes if you, if you turn it around on the back of the label, 
a lot of times on the back of the label they'll show you what that blend is to the certain yeah like mine says yeah. i don't know if you can see it's probably reversed but it's the grenache and around the the c one that you mentioned quinoa or sinso or a lot of french people the are the c-o-u and quinoa the yeah. market yeah, so they're trying to get better. Um, they're trying to get better with listing the varietals because um, it can be confusing for the American consumer that, you know, is, isn't is one out, like hasn't traveled or isn't studying wine. You know, they just want a great bottle of wine. And uh, so it's great to see, um, you know, that they are starting to put them on the back label because that, to, you know, as Jimmy asked, it is about the region when it comes to old world wine. And when I say old world wine, I mean like France, Italy, um, you know, not uh, some other reasons. I don't want to go off on a tangent, but primarily those two regions are going to be listed by the region. Um, and then the other aspect with what you brought up, Jimmy, is to, um, oh, we have a new, hello, Jenny. Welcome, Jenny. Sorry, I'm late. That's okay. We're just getting ready to get started on uh, the regions. And I was just answering a question, so no worries. Um, always like shop when you're buying imports, it's really important to look at who the importer is. Uh, because if you like that wine, chances are you're going to like other wines from that importer as well. So it'll just sort of train you to start shopping by importer rather than just a cute label. Um, and when in doubt, always talk to whomever is working at the store or if you're buying online, you know, a lot of times you can send the person a question or there's a pop up that you can ask the question. Um, but yeah, always that's one of the first things that's that's super important when it comes to, you know, shopping for, for the imports. Um, so again, back to the Cote de Rome. So this is the largest wine region in all of the Southern Rome. And if we go back to that second map, I'll show you all the different regions that you can see um, where it's highlighted. Um, so all the, the darker pink and lighter pink, that is all Cote de Rhone, which that's just insane of how large that, I mean, it looks large on a map, it's really small. Um, and we can cut back to uh, the video. And um, you are going to find like some really tremendous values from this region. It's what I have in my glass. Um, the wines can range from actually, actually basic to really outstanding. And this goes back to really doing your research and finding a good importer um, and making a note. Just take a picture with your camera. If you like the wine that you drank, take a picture of the back um, label and just create a file like in your, in your cell phone of producers that or importers that you liked. Um, another tip to finding uh, outstanding Cote de Rome wines is um, if you can find them as close to like where that crew is, um, like Chateauneuf de Pop, Sable, these other crews that I'm going to talk about, you're going to find the, the better terroir. Um, and again, when it comes to doing your research, traditionally Grenache should be the first grade. Um, with things modernizing, and the demand that was once, I feel like things are changing, but um, us in the United States, we used to want bigger, bolder, higher alcohol style wines. And so the, some of the producers were sort of changing their style and putting Syrah as you know, a larger base in the blend. And um, it just sort of goes against tradition. And it just goes against when I've tried a lot of them. A lot of them just don't have that soul of like Grenache, you know? They taste just like a blend to me, you know? Like if I'm just gonna buy a blend, I'll just like go to Australia and buy a GSM, you know? So it's like, you should, it should always, in my opinion, <laughs> be like Grenache based because they're just much more beautiful the texture, I talk about texture a lot when it comes to the wines from the Southern Rhone and the aromatics and 
anyone that want to share what they're what they're tasting and what they're getting um if that makes sense if anything i said translates to aromatics and structure and mouthfeel and can, can you can you like what's the difference between a grenache and a syrah they're just two different grapes well, right. so grenache is essentially a lighter style grape syrah is a heavier style grape um they blend really really well together because as you see you know you've got a light versus a heavy and blend them together it sort of evens itself out if you will and that was my thought on like as i'm sitting here sipping away like this is a very light drinkable wine like it it it's not one of those where I feel like I'm having to chew it and take my time with it a little bit. This this one for me, it's it's a very easy drinking wine, you know. Yeah, you yeah, have a fabulous wine. Sorry, Becky, go ahead. I was say, as I say, I I felt similarly in the sense that like so I poured a glass for um, the people that I'm with, and she was like, it's kind of acidic and it's a little bit tart, and I was like, I enjoy that because. I think it takes away some of like the heaviness. Like I don't, I appreciate some of like a sharp contrast to different flavors. And like, for me, it's like, it could even be like, depending on how people feel, it could be like lightly chilled even, and still provide a lot of like depth to everything. But it's, it's a really nice, like overall feel to everything, but it's definitely it's got like a sharpness to it, which I appreciate because I think it kind of like wakes up the palate for me. Agreed. And like the sharpness refers to sort of like acidity, which like a lot yeah, of exactly. times, you know, the old world wines, they need food. Um, right. You know, if you're used to drinking more new world style wines, um, it, you're just immediately sort of hit with fruit. Um, and you're used to like things that are maybe more powerful and thing. And, and, mm -hmm. but, and it's the, the, the most interesting thing that like that I would get is um, you know, and I would taste with consumers that weren't used to French wine was they would say, oh, this is really light and this is really watery. And, and I'm like, well, what do you normally drink? And they're like, Napa Cab. And I'm like, that's what you're used to drinking. Of course, like a Grenache is going to taste like, you know, like, I don't know, watered down Coke or something. Yeah, go ahead, bro. Right. I can tell you that Spanish and Australian people say the same thing about French wine, not just American. Right. Anybody comes from a country where they make bigger style wines, and in fact, I would say France and Italy are exceptions. They're very light and very high acid compared to those drinking Australia, California, Spain, many, many other regions. France is going to be high acid, and the Spanish often say, oh, the French wine is like a nothing. It's like a water. Right. <laughs> and you cannot control a bottle. <laughs> Yeah, it's very true. The Spanish, like Spanish Garnacha compared to French Grenache, like the Spanish Garnacha is definitely, you know, we did this tour when we did the Grenache tasting, that they are definitely uh, very robust and powerful. Um, yeah, they don't like anything light in Spain, except Albarino, they're starting to develop a palate, but. And Chocolina. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll get get into. Nothing wine though, you know, like actually we, we drink chocolate more respectfully than they do. They're like, whatever, it's like a pre-dinner right. drink. Yeah, the Spaniards are interesting when it comes to wine. <laughs> they make great wine, they don't necessarily drink great wine. They drink more it's beer such a weird They're big such a funny place place to go. <laughs> yeah, so cool. Well then, when also, I don't know, so the other region, um, when you're out shopping, you may see Cote de Rhone Village, um, which is basically a little smaller region of the Cote de Rhone. And without spending too much time, that just means you're just going to be stepping up a little bit in quality. Um, again, always do your research. Like I say, every time I do these calls, take away three things for me, please. Like every night, to have three things that help you like become a better shopper. Um, so the biggest region in all of the Southern Rhone, I shouldn't say biggest meaning largest, I should just say meaning like the king region is uh, Chateauneuf de Pop. And I touched on this when we did the Grenache tasting and um, it translates to House of the Pope. And not that that maybe means anything, but um, you know, wine is about history as well, especially 
in the old world. And it refers to a time when the Roman Catholic Church was um, in the city of Avignon. And this was in the like mid 14th century. And um, before that, winemaking actually goes back to the 12th century. But interestingly enough, it wasn't until I think like 1936 that Chateauneuf du Pop got its AOC designation. And they were actually the first um, to get that, uh, that, that established um, inference. And uh, so if you look at on a map, which I'm not gonna, oh, you should, sorry, throw up a picture of the town of, uh, so just gonna show you right here, it's orange, my husband's favorite color, if you go back, so you can see where we're talking about here. Go back, sorry. There we go. So the town of Orange, which is highlighted there, is the, the main village, if you will, within Chateauneuf du Pop. So that's basically where I was talking about. Um, and so it's a pretty small region, as you can see, compared to like the Cote d'Iron, Cote d'Iron village. Um, so if you go over to the next slide, which we saw the, the soils, that's one of the soil types that are in that region. And then the next slide, is just basically the the town. Um, look how tiny that is. That's like downtown Chateauneuf Pop. <laughs> um, That's why they all cool. party in Avignon. <laughs> yeah, big party there. So you can see some of the destruction on that tower from uh, the war. Um, so great. So we'll go back. Um, so the region is, you know, some. Some of the areas that we've talked about are mountainous and all that. The region here is not that. It's pretty much a plateau. Uh, you've got a few hills and um, the, like I mentioned, the soils aren't just rocks. You have clay and sand that are also found throughout the region. And a lot of producers um, will pay homage to that and do single vineyard bottlings um, of one that's just done in rock soil, uh, one that's done in sand, and one that's done in clay. So really tremendous to sort of taste those together um, in a tasting if you ever get that opportunity. 93% um, of the wines here uh, from Chateauneuf du Pop, actually maybe 95%, are red wine. So it's really you know special if you can find a white one because they are fabulous, like they will age. Um, the reds are excellent for aging. They can last, depending on the vintage, anywhere from 10 to 20 years. And so with that, with Chateauneuf du Pop, that you're, you're, it's also the most expensive in all of the Southern Rome. Um, but the wines are some of the most magical that you'll ever taste. You can find them at some decent prices. Um, I, my company actually imports one that's um, actually, I have their Cote de Rome. Le Clos de Caillou, again, I'm not trying to be salesy here, but I just want you to know that um, Le Clos de Caillou is, is incredible and um, one of the best price Chateauneuf de Pops that you can find on the market. An extremely traditional biodynamic producer. Um, so going back to the region, uh, you will notice like if you pay attention to the alcohol percentages, I know some of us like Jimmy, who's on our calls regularly, like that's sort of important because he's like a fitness guru um, and doesn't want to like have like a crazy hangover. Um, this region is very warm. The wines are naturally going to be higher in alcohol. Um, it's also the region that by law, they have to be at least 12 and a half percent. So you will not find a wine from Chateauneuf du Pop, maybe Cote de Rome, but Chateauneuf du Pop, you're not going to find a wine underneath 12 and a half percent. I think and not underneath 14. <laughs> yeah, they usually, some of them are about 15.5. Like I've never seen a Chateauneuf wine. du Pop that's 12 and a half percent. <laughs> no, they're usually average about 14. Yeah, Sometimes, and it's like in... Yeah, 2009 was a hot vintage, and those wines were like 15.5, and that's yeah. naturally. So that's not adding sugar. 
because when you add sugar to wine, it elevates the alcohol percentages, and that's what makes you feel like crap. When you have wines that have natural uh, high alcohol, you're not gonna get that like burning feeling. You're not gonna like feel like toast in the morning because it's natural. So does that make sense? Unless you drink two bottles and don't drink any water. Well, yeah. <laughs> I'm usually that? like less than a hangover. You exactly. Can it for sure. Yes. <laughs> I always got my water. <laughs> oh, <Lord>. Yeah. <laughs> you need one of those hats where like wine yeah. coming in one side, water coming in the other side, just don't blend them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so what's also cool about this region, um, it's so traditional that I love it that like so if you've been to wineries and you go into their cellar, you see like, like all these like oak barrels. Um, when you go into the cellars in the Rhone Valley, you don't get that. Like the wines are traditionally, like they're fermented in like these large cement tanks. And that's as natural or as old school as you get. Um, so I have moved to large stainless steel. Uh, we call them vats. Um, it's just a descriptor for the the large uh, vessel if you will for fermentation and it really helps with the pureness of the wines um why is that because they're able to keep the temperature cooler because during the fermentation process wine heats up um if you can avoid that and keeping the temperature a little cooler you're going to have a finer product um, and it's also sealed. When, if you're fermenting in oak, oak has, you can, it can breathe. And so it's going to be more subjected to like ex exterior elements, if you will. So it's going to allow like some more heat to come involved. Um, it's gonna allow like maybe some humidity depending on the environment. Um, and it's going to also like, especially when you're making white wine, it could, cause early oxidation and that's not what you want when you're making wine um so that's pretty awesome so when it comes to aging the wine uh, a lot of producers are still traditional and they'll use neutral oak large vats because they want the wines to be extremely pure and expressive of their vineyards they don't want a lot of oak to manipulate what they work so hard on in the vineyards. And if you remember like when we had our little Chardonnay thing, you know, I talked a lot about, uh, you know, how some of the winemakers manipulate the flavors and the tastes and all that about Chardonnay. This is not the case here. They want the wines to taste like a fruit of their labor, if you will. Um, but with that said, some producers are starting to move to adding some new oak. So any questions before we move on? Okay, rock and roll. Uh, my next favorite region, and I'm gonna try to move a little bit faster here, uh, just because I was looking at the time clock. Uh, Gigandas. I love Gigandas. I know, Gigandas. Ah, <sighs> yes. Okay. It is, so way different. It is, it is similar to Chat Neuf de Pop, but it's really not. Um, it's a little more affordable. Um, when I mentioned crew, Gigandas is a crew uh, within the Southern Rome, so it's one of the best of the best regions in the Southern Rome. Um, it's typically overlooked. Like, it's still, like, difficult for me to get Gigandas, like, on a regular wine list, if you will. Um, especially, like, when you go to, like, a steakhouse. You know, they love having, like, Southern Rome wines because they do great with steak. Um, but Gigandas is one, they're like, ah, nobody knows it. Americans are still sort of discovering it. Wine Geeks, of course, we all know it. Um, it is, uh, again, age-worthy, and what's different than the Chat Neuf de Pop, which I mentioned, is a plateau. Gigandas is higher altitude, and uh, we're at the base of a mountain range, which I'll show you a picture of, called the Dentillas de Montmirail. And it basically, it translates to the teeth. They're these jagged, jagged 
hills that, um, I don't know, Dave or Laurel, if either of you have traveled to that region. I know you all have been all over France. I have. Uh, Brooklyn, well. Yeah, and so can I you think show, Brooklyn there too. Yeah, I have. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's can you show a slide real quick? You can talk and show the slide. Can you show the slide real yeah, quick? Yeah, I can, I can show the slide, yeah. Uh, Mont Ventoux is not too really far cool. from here, which is one of the really famous um, tour stops for the Tour de France. Um, this is the Cote de Ventoux. Ventoux is kind of over here. It's a big mountain. Kind of comes out of nowhere. It just, yeah. This area is generally kind of flat, and then all of a sudden you just have these teeth. Is what they, they kind of look like that. Um, I don't know all the ge geology of what happened here, but it looks to me like you had two plates come together. One went like that and one went like that. <laughs> and they just go. Pow. Yeah, so you can see Cote de Ventoux and Vaccara, which I'll talk about, is right, uh, right by Cote de Ventoux, where that mountain range, the next slide, is will show you. Is this here, yeah? This is the yellow? Yeah, the yellow. Yeah. It's very small, very, very small. So you can see why it's overlooked because not much wine gets exported. So go to the next slide. No, next one, sorry. Next one. This one. There we go. Yeah. So that's what that mountain range looks like. And when I was talking about Garrigue earlier, what gives a lot of this terroir in the wines is what's in the forefront here. Um, is like you've got you see these little olive trees that are there like a lot of times these reds like when you put your nose in them you're like wow it smells like olives like it's just amazing and I get a lot of like like thyme and rosemary so you can exit out of there um, Oops. so when you step into Gigandas and the style um, because it's a higher altitude I mean the wines are still powerful but um, they're also softer than Chateauneuf de Pop, generally speaking. Again, generally speaking, because I think they're much the more elegant. Much more elegant, much more approachable, young. Um, but if you if you have some patience and you can give them five years at least in a bottle, you're gonna do yourself an amazing lamb steak dinner night. <laughs> yeah, um, you should, uh, you yeah. Should go the best. Um, and what's also, what's really unique here is uh, these wins that we talked about, Kala on one of our calls, the Grenache call, paired an awesome song that gave tribute to the Mistral winds um, that is really, really famous um, in, in the Southern Road. And there are these, I experienced, they're in Spain too. Like I experienced it when I was in Spain. There are these like just intense winds that are like, all of a sudden it just gets really chilly. And they come through and they just cool the vineyards down in this super hot region. And it also helps with pest management, um, which I was talking about how so many of these producers, uh, wineries, if you will, in the region are able to easily be organic because they have a natural defender right here. These like strong winds just go in and like knock out all these pests. Um, so definitely not much white wine, if at all comes out of Gigandas, but uh, Rosé does and definitely red wine. So I think like on your shopping pleasure, you know, seek out uh, Gigandas. And um, any questions before I move to the next region? When you keep bringing up about them being <clears throat> naturally organic and bio, are you talking about this entire region or just some of these little, the crews with inside, inside those? Sure. So uh, the more natural, or sorry, the more sub-regions, if you will. I know a lot of Cote de Rhone, um producers have moved to organic farming. Um, but also one thing about Cote de Rhone, the market is flooded, flooded. Like there's so many Cote Rhones out there and there's so many that just taste so basic I yeah. mean I, you know I, they're just, they all taste the same and they're all the same price and they to me they taste like crappy Syrah yeah like and they're all like I said they're all the same price and because they're all competing for that market shelf space in in retail and they're all competing for that by the glass when you go to a restaurant or a wine bar um, cause usually there is like a Cote Rhone that's offered at a wine bar and Cote Rhones are pretty popular in retail because they're so affordable. 
But again, that goes back to like doing your research, looking at your importer. You know, I know you sent me two earlier, Jimmy, today, and I was immediately like, nope. <laughs> Those aren't going to be like. A lot of bad like, coats around. A lot of bad coats around. So much bad. It's like Chardonnay. There's a lot of bad, like, you know, Chardonnay I mean, out there. There's I mean, a lot of bad Cote d'Rhone. Every region has their commercial craft. Exactly. And like Cote d'Rhone is like a workhorse um, for value wine in France um, because everybody knows it. And so, yeah, you got a lot of these wineries or company owned wineries, as is really what it is, um, chasing after that segment. So, but um, yeah, always. Do Can I ask one more question? Yes, of course. So, like when we were we were having that conversation, and you asked me if there, you were asked, you brought up the, what is that, brote or brote or however you pronounce this? Yes, correct. Now, were you wanting me specifically to look for this, or who the importer is here in the states? Um. Well, so Texas is a little different because you guys have really multiple different. importers for the same producer. Yeah. But. I knew, I know the producer. Okay. Because so, like the back, obviously it's W Direct and it's like Lawrence, Kansas and stuff. So what, what about, so is this the winery? Is that what you were asking me? That's the producer, correct. Okay. And I know that producer because the, one of the uh, collab, collaborators, if you will, in that, in, within that winery is one of the best in okay. all of Rome. Like he also owns vineyards in Northern Rome. Like the man is like the SHIT. Gotcha. Um, he's actually even gone to Morocco and has like planted vineyards in Morocco. Got um, it. Cool. Yeah. So I think like, again, I mean, again, you know, like it's always like doing your research and maybe talking to, and don't be afraid to like get on your phone and do a quick little Google search of like, like Gigal, you know, Gigal right. is not a bad producer, but uh, Gigal is more about the Northern Rome than the Southern Rome. Gotcha. Um, but again, like they've become quite commercial. They've become quite commercial, not a fan. So. Gotcha. Awesome. <laughs> like making sure is anyone down here? I did a call once where like some lady was from something and she was like, those are fabulous. <laughs> Um, so we're uh so we'll go back to that the southern rhone map if you will i think it's the second slide we're going to talk about bantu okay wait one one thing before we move i i have a producer that if you if you want something a bit more elegant than shatnip to pop and you want to try a gigonda i recommend looking for santa duke i knew santa, you were going to talk about santa duke <laughs> they're phenomenal santa phenomenal. is it like cloth I'll type it in. <laughs> yeah. Type you, it yeah, in the comments. In the, the main Santa Duke. Will you put it in the chat? Yeah, we'll put it in the comments. But they're not easy to find, but it's phenomenal wines from Gigonda. And but for the East Coast folks, uh, like Becky, she should be able to find Domain Santa Duke because when I lived in Baltimore, I drank a shit ton of Domain Santa Duke. It's getting I'll, have to, I'll have to keep an eye out then. Yeah. 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 The the actually the original importer, he used to live in Maryland. Um, ah. yeah, and, and he's since sold, but anyway, won't get into all that. Uh, so we'll go back to, they are good. <laughs> they're great. They're great. We'll go to the second map, the little small, um, sorry, I missed the button there. So the next region, uh, we're going to talk about is Bantu. Ah. There you go, right there. So you can see um, Cote de Bantu, which we were just talking about, that green region. So that's where we are now. So again, we can go, we can cut out of that. Um, we're at the foothills of that mountain range that I was talking about, the teeth. I'm just gonna keep referring them to the teeth. Um, Cause that's how like the, the French talk about them. So again, like Gigandas, higher elevation, cooler conditions, so what that's going to equate to is generally lighter styles. So if, for instance, your Cote d'Rhone may have come from a region closer to Bantu, it's going to be lighter in style as if it came from somewhere else. Um, these are mostly red blends and rosés. Uh, there are whites that are starting to become much better. And uh, Bantu is a region that I struggled for a really hard time and still do to try to get wine buyers to embrace. 
Um, because why? It's overshadowed by these big name regions. Um, but you can find some insane values here. So um, I encourage you, um, the last slide will have, you know, you can take a screenshot of, that'll be able, that'll have it all spelled out. Um, but Bantu is just beautiful. A little bit more rustic than you're gonna find from Giganos. Um, the next region I'll talk about, uh, you can cut back to that other slide again that shows the map. Vakara which you can see we're in the same area that I'm still focusing on, like at the foothills of the, the teeth, even smaller than Gigandas. Totally small, that little purple dot on the map. I love Vakara, and I get so excited, you can cut out of that, um, I get so excited when um, my buyers embrace it, when the sommeliers are like, Hey, that tastes like a baby gigandas um, because it basically does. And they're insane values. It's a newer crew. Um, and um, it's also the soil types are different here. You've got like sand that's mixed with rocks. Um, they're a little bit more rustic. Um, but you've also got all of these things that happen in gigandas that are happening in Vakara, but in a smaller region. And at a lesser price than even Gigandas, which is at a lesser price, generally speaking, than Chaton Pop. So, anyone here have a Vakara on that they're drinking? Not? That's all right. But definitely something to explore. And again, the last slide you can take a photo of that'll have uh, these regions. Um, we can go back the next which I'm going to talk about, and we don't need to keep going back to that slide. It's, it's Resto. Um, this is also right by there. It's um, the a newer crew that was established in 2010, so only 10 years old. And so when I say a new crew established, it means like they used to just have Cote de Rome. Um, so there's, they're, they've been elevated to um, a status of crew. So again, to remind you that means like these winemakers are going to the French government and they're going to them and telling their stories of why they need to be established as a crew. They're saying we have these soil types, we have this terroir, this is what's going on here in order to make our wines different than just Cote de Rome. So again you're going to have different soil types here. We have limestone, sand, and rocks. So three different soil types that are found throughout the region, sometimes collectively. Um, this is also one of the regions in the Southern Rhone that you can find sweet wine. Uh, I have a girlfriend that only likes to drink dessert wine. And so it's like, this is one of the regions I tell her if you want red wine for a dessert wine that you're gonna have like with your dinner, here you go. <laughs> um, so then the next one region, oh, well, we're almost through this, right? Um, Sable is a, another crew, and Sable is basically named after what it is. It's like a sandy mound. Um, so you've got mostly sand mixed with rocks. Uh, again, we're still in this region. That's these small areas that are at the foothills of the, the Teeth Mountains. Um, this is mostly dedicated to red wine uh, production. They, to me, are just, they're seductive. They're so soft because I feel like the sand soil in this area, they're approachable, like, when they're young. And this is the soil type that dominates Sable is, is sand. And um, they're going to be a softer style. So if you want less muscle and you want more lady, try <laughs> look for Sable. Um, the next region and is Kairan. Um, this is the newest of all crews. So five years ago is when they got established. And you think about this, they've been making wine since the 12th century. 
So it wasn't until 2015 that this small group, I mean, this is a tinier region, that these winemakers were finally able to, to like convince the French government of why this should be elevated from just cooked rum. Um, this is the region also like, if you love Chateau de Pop and you want to value, Chiron is definitely one of them. Don't worry about spelling. If you're taking notes, take that picture of the slide at the end. Um, very few are exported because it's a very small region, but the Psalms are really, 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 really starting to fall in love with this region. Um, it's cool. They also, aside from just like rocks, they have like clay, they have silt, they have chalk. I mean, you've got all these different elements going on. Um, and they'll age, like they will totally age. Like it's fabulous, fabulous. That's what you're drinking, Jimmy. Your wine is from a more specific, you have a wine from Chiron. It's the one you got, right? Correct, correct. You've got it right there. So tell us about it. What do you think? I was saying earlier, it's, it's, it's a very easy drinking wine. I really like, cause it, it's, it's light, it, it feels, open it's not you know it's not compared to some of these other things that we've tasted along the way like during the different weeks or anything um and i, I had it with dinner tonight with just with like a filet and like i enjoy it because i didn't need it i didn't need it. i need some big gigantic wine to go along with with my steak tonight you know so i, I really i really like it yeah and it's a young vintage i think it's 2018 16. 16. Oh, perfect vintage. Yeah. 2016, by the way, just side note, epic vintage in the Rome. Like, epic, know. epic, stellar, worthy vintage. Like, growing conditions were perfect. Um, yeah, and it, that's, that's great. When any people ask me, like, you know, what should I pair with my steak? Because automatically people are always like, oh, I should have, like, cab. And I'm like, have you tried anything from the Rhone? You know, like it has much more acidity. And for those, you know, you've been on these calls with me for a while. I always say, talk about how higher acid wines cut through fat. You know, when, when you're drinking Napa Cab, you got a lot of fat going on already and a lot of tannins and they're not really higher in acidity. And when you pair that with a steak, it's just like blah, 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 in your mouth. Yep. When you have something that has higher acidity, it's going to like just pair really, really, really well with fatty foods. And one of the most perfect red meat pairings um, is, is lamb. Um, and that's another thing. I'm sorry, I'm going off on a tangent that I'm gonna get into with some of our future seminars is um, you know, more pairings and what you can do with that like for dinner or what have you. We were talking about the white um, Southern Rhone wines. Um, they are perfect wines uh, for like Thanksgiving food. Um, they are, anytime anyone asks me what, and we'll, maybe we'll do a Thanksgiving special or something like that. But um, they are like, they go great with stuffing. They go great with turkey. You know, they go great with, you know, all these different things that, that in my world, some people find to be a cliche, but something I want to share with folks that are just discovering wine. Um, so with well, that, it's not, not to cut you off, but it's funny yeah. because I remember around Thanksgiving, I went to this wine store for like a small tasting and they're like, get all these rosés. And I typically drink like a rosé or something like that with Thanksgiving just because we're usually together for several hours. It's a lot easier to drink a rosé in things like in November than it is to drink a red wine over the course of many hours. So we would do rosé and champagne or whatever. But then like I started doing like tasting things. I was like, oh, this makes more sense in terms of flavor profile. So I was like, I get that. But like it took me a while. I was like, I just did it because it was an easier alcohol to drink. But now that I like have started doing more understanding about flavor profiles I'm like oh no I actually understand the connection between them totally and like you know my sister's on this call and you know I haven't had Thanksgiving dinner with her in a really long time and you know I would always show up with like, 
like four bottles, you know, and she'd have her four bottles and, you know, <laughs> and it's always like, you know, and I remember when I first met my husband and, um, you know, we had dinner together and we did Thanksgiving together for the first time because he didn't have his kids and he was like, we have two wines to sit down to. We had a white and a red. And I'm like, hell yeah. Like you get to experiment with like what tur turkey tastes like with a white wine that's paired perfectly for it and a red wine. And uh, Kelly, did you have something to say? Bertha? You were she always hated what I brought. Huh? <laughs> what? You always hated what I brought. <laughs> <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> brought the cocktail wine. <laughs> I hate well, what yeah, I mean, it's you know, I mean, it's not going to go bad, you know. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, there's never any, like, you know, like, not having too much wine, you know. But I always that's feel like, like... That's like mom with the bee, the bee ringer. The Behringer. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's about, that's about the taste of my mom's husband. And he always tries to pour me wine, and I'm like, no, thank you. <laughs> And he's like, oh, you don't like this? I'm like, oh, no, no, I'm just, you know, not right now. And then I turn around and fill my glass with something else. <laughs> yeah, right. Mark Third time around, you'll be okay with it. <laughs> That's familiar. If you've gone to uh, who our, 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 our ex-aunt, uh, it was all about quantity and not quality. So it's the franzia of <laughs> at, at, at that point, yeah, box wine is good. <laughs> You know, I love these stories from like the holidays, you know, because like you show up, you just never know what you're going to get, you know, <laughs> and I used to take my wine and I would tell Kelly, like, this is the good shit at Aunt Lori's and I'd put it in the fridge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hey, I need to agree today. <laughs> I used boxed wine that was left over because um, recycling was coming. So I wanted to get rid of it. <laughs> And I had a neighbor that had a box of fruit delivered, and she didn't want it. So I'm like, shit. <laughs> Made sangria. Exactly. That's what I, my, my number one tip is, like, you know, when your wine is starting to get old, make sangria. Or if, like, you're having a party and somebody brings you some crap wine, you know, like, save it and make sangria. Is that the new version I, I instead of I, if life gives you lemons, if life gives you boxed wine, make sangria? Right. There, there's your next answer, Nicole. Is if, if life, yeah, if there's the next, there's the next apron or whatever. If life gives you boxed wine, make sangria. There's coming to you, Jimmy. And I did. I'm gonna make it pink so you'll wear it all, all day. Tank top and pink. Yes. No, yeah, it has to be sleeveless. Oh, I should have put on my pop tank Gotta top. show the guns. <laughs> I should have put on the tank top. That, oh, damn. It's all right. <laughs> but it is fine. Next I one. know. Next I love, one. like, all these stories of people, like, and their different things about wine. It's so funny. Um, the last region I'll talk about, um, because it's, like, ah. Uh, it's one that, that Dave and I drink a lot of, um, and it's only just starting to become like known about in the United States. It's a region called Le Rock, and it is, so there's a river that runs down through, through uh, well, a lot of France, but we'll just talk about the Southern Room, that runs through, it's the Rhone River that runs through the center of the area, and, uh, we have um, on one side Chateau du Pop and on the other side Lee Rock. And um, so there's the river, like, uh, you see, there we are. See the river? The river's the baby blue that goes through there, cutting up and sort of dividing the region, if you will. Um, and so Lee Rock shares the same exact soils that you get from Chateau du Pop. Um, it is also a crew, which Chateauneuf de Pop is. It's just lesser known. And you just don't see any, if at all. Maybe if you're lucky, if you go to some super geeky wine shop, you will find a wine from Lee Rock. They are more than, they're like more than half the price 
that you're going to pay for a Chateauneuf pop. And they'll age. They are, and they have the same sort of bottle types, everything. They're primarily Grenache. Um, the sommeliers are really, really starting to hone in on this region, at least the ones that I talk to. Um, so something to really look forward to as uh, the market starts to expand a little bit more in this region, because I feel like wine shops and sommeliers are starting to get a little bit tired of Cote de Rhone. I know I've been selling a lot more of Lee Rock because I'm out there telling the story. Um, I'm also selling it direct to consumers, telling them of the story of the values that you can get uh, from this area. And they're going to be a way higher level than you're going to get from just a Cote de Rhone. So you can back out of that and we can ask if there's any questions. And that's all I got for the little like educational portion. I, I, th I think just one of the things you said there that it has interested me, certainly got me interested in wine, is telling the story, you know, and it's like, you know, you just sort of see wine or whatever. Once you start to dive in, you learn these regions and you realize like there's a place like that that's literally on the other side of the river. I mean, how different could the soils have been? At some point, there was a glacier that receded through that valley and just ripped that thing to shreds. It, it just couldn't possibly be that different. Why, why does Chateauneuf de Pop become Chateauneuf de Pop and Laroque become now emerging? I mean, when Chateauneuf de Pop is like probably one of the better known. Yeah, I mean, that's an amazing question. I mean, I think a lot of it that um, has to do, uh, we talk about, we've, you've read the book Wine and War. Um, you know, Napoleon went through and was, you know, buying the, or stealing the best of the best and all that. Um, you know, I think historically you have these big names that people know and once it crosses the pond, you know, they, they really only know like the big names and that's all they want to buy. Like, it's interesting when you, when you go to like, like me trying to sell wine to a steakhouse and like, if I was to show them like in Le Rock, they were like, no one would buy this. They all want Chateauneuf Pop. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. It's money. It's money and marketing. I mean, right, it's marketing. But the, the caveat is, is that the more money you have, the actually the better wine you can make and the better grapes you can grow because that region got investment and it has buyers. And so it becomes the best region yeah. because it has those investments and those buyers and more plantings and they evolve and they make wine for longer and they get better at it faster because of all of these things. You know? is, that, is, that because, is that because they have more money to build better facilities, right? Like the ground is the same. It's everything, it's everything. It's, it's from the base level, it's they planted there first, then there's people with money there. Let's say the popes loved that region because the popes love it, it's famous. Then the nobles buy it. Then everybody in England buys it because the nobles buy it. Then yeah. it becomes the wine of kings. Then more people want to buy it. The demand grows, more is planted and so on and so on. And then the whole world learns that name because that's already the most famous. But at the same time, they're also becoming the best region because they're practicing and they're becoming more and more experienced and their vines are getting older. So it's, it's so many things. And at the same time on the periphery, you have stragglers with just a few vineyards. They're not really learning much. They're not really, they're not, they don't have the infrastructure. So it's, there's so many interesting and well, and then also probably you're not producing people, a lot of wine either. You also get people exactly. writing off the coattails of the, the name, like, oh, I have vineyards in Chateauneuf de Pop, and here's yeah. my wine. Whereas, like, you get these outlying regions where these producers have to work extra hard to get their region elevated to a crew status. Um, and yeah. so the wines are just only getting better. And they are starting to realize, hey, we need to invest more money in our infrastructure to make better wine in order to compete, in order to get world status play, you know, so, so to speak. Um, so I love what's happening in the Iraq. You know, one thing that um, some importers do is um, that have been established in France for a long time. Um, you know, Kermit Lynch being one of them, my company being one of them, going in and working, realizing the value 
that's within these sub regions and finding like the the legit like producers that are willing because the french are stubborn i'm stubborn the french are stubborn and that are willing to understand like you know this is how you can elevate your status this is how we can help you make better wine and working with them and saying you know you need to get rid of this and you need to import you know you need to be working with this sort of thing and helping them create better wine to get into the world stage i keep calling it the world stage and that's just quotes and quotes um because i do think these wine these regions need attention and this is why i wanted to talk and dig deeper into the southern road because it's just so fascinating because what most people think about is Cote d'Arone and Chateauneuf de Pop. Like that's mostly what, generally speaking, the American consumer like thinks about. But we just went through about an hour of like other regions that you can like look at, which you can share that screenshot that, that you can take a photo of. Um, and just start playing around and just start looking and, and seeing what you can find and experimenting. And that's like the beauty about wine and, you know. Any other questions? Before I talk next week, um, I hope you guys enjoyed this. I hope it was still fun. Um, and we're gonna talk about Albarino. Uh, who here knows the grape? So. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> it's white and it's from Spain. And it's delicious. <laughs> so I'll tell you. Time. It's fantastic. And you can like there's so many places where you go and the list is a little maybe a dicey. Maybe you have a little dicey list, but there's an Albarino and you're like, well, maybe I might roll the dice on that one. <laughs> I might might roll the dice on that one. Uh, I, my Portuguese spelling is bad. I love seafood, and you love warm weather. Than no. is the wine. Oh, uh, oh. So it's grown. It's you know indigenous to Spain, but they also it's also indigenous to Portugal. But it's just called Alparinho versus Albarinho. So next week, um, figured you know it's probably going to be pretty hot. I'm almost sweating up here now. Uh, my windows are closed. Uh, great white wine to get together and toast with. Um, the expressions that you get through Alvarino in Spain are outstanding. Um, it's a really unique part of Spain. It's, you know, Spain is mostly known for red wine. Um, so I hope to see you guys next week to learn a little bit. And, and you buy one from Portugal too. Um, but we're going to have Brooke on next week because she's traveled all throughout Rias Baixas, where it primarily comes from. Um, to talk about it, and we're going to have some awesome pictures that are probably going to blow your mind um, of yeah, how the vines great. are totally different than what you normally see. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. Yeah. Wait, it's, when I'm there. <laughs> yeah, and it's a perfect summer wine because it's grown on the coast in Spain. Like, so you get like this. Oh, no. You can taste the salt in the air. Yeah, totally. So why don't you throw up that last slide that yeah. everyone so a quick, a quick note from your producer here. Um, I, this is <laughs> uploaded, this slide is uploaded into the chat, this one here. So you can just take that and again, save it to your phone is probably what I would recommend. Then you have, you start to create a little file of your own sort of favorite things. These are all the different areas we talked about, the different grapes that we talked about. Again, all the slides are going to be included in the recording of the uploading. But you know, if you didn't know how to spell vaccara, now you do. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, we'll we'll kind of just continue to do this. And tr the idea is to really try and if you want to take a picture of this right now in your time, um, the idea is to just kind of continue to give resources to people to understand these different areas and what they can go and expect, so that when you go to a wine shop. You know, over time you develop a taste for the thing you like, and then you can go and say, I like this. Do you have that? Mm -hmm. And the wine stores, I think, generally are just so willing to, they're so excited to talk to people, honestly. Can you imagine they are. sitting they, there all day and no yeah. one wants to talk to you because they all right. think they know everything? The I mean, I I've had a great experience, like, 
since doing this, being able to call like a couple of my favorite wine stores and being like, I'm doing this tasting. I just need this and this and like this grape or this region, like whatever, like or a variety. And I've gotten such amazing things. Even when it was um, when we did the Chardonnay, and even though I asked for like specific regions, they like, gave me like a South Australian because I told him I didn't want something oaky, and he was like, "Here you go." And I was like, "Well, that wasn't what I asked for." But then I tried it. I was like, "This was my favorite one of everything that I had." So it was such a great experience. And I've been like. Well, I've been obviously been telling everybody else. Like, this is such a fun situation for me to like figure out where and what I like in a way that I don't think you could just like do in like a wine tasting or like anything else. Like it's such a broad experience over several weeks. It's been amazing. Thank you. And that's why I feel like this sort of format rather than like boxing you in and making you for, for right now, I think as we still discover wine together, boxing you in and making you buy a particular wine, you know, because you might not like it. Like, I want to be able to allow, like, you know, everyone to just be like, this is what we're going to be talking about, you know, and this is what I don't like, you know, because maybe, like, if I have one that is, like, oaky or whatever, you know what I mean? Like, if something, like, so you, it gives you the free will to be able to, like, just go get what you want, and be at a price point that what's comfortable for you. Right. Um, yeah, and with every bottle that you buy, you add the possibility that gets higher and higher that what you ask for will be exactly what you want in the future. Because the more right. you know, the better the response is going to be that you get. If you walk in and say, I want a white wine that's $15, you can, it's a crapshoot. Right. If you walk in and you say, I like white wine from the Loire region of France and I have a $15 budget, you're going to get a very specific <laughs> recommendation, you know? And even better if you give them a winery that you like from that region, and then that tells them what your palate is. They want to be your friend. Like, they're not there to, like, you know, price totally. gouge you. The independent, trust me, the independent, like, wine shop, they are up against a lot of obstacles from, like, wine.com, you know, a lot of these, like, online guys that, that like, undercut and price wines ridiculously just to be able to get the the volume whereas just shopping locally and supporting local like they that that's that's great becky like you're you're establishing like a relationship with them you know what i mean and so that's what wine is also about is like it's about a relationship and bringing people together and for them being like looking forward to seeing you oh there she is she's curious she wants to <laughs> And being open to their suggestions, you know? Mm -hmm. And, like, if they see you coming back in the door again, they're just like, we did our job, you know? Yeah. That, that to me, is just, like, beautiful. Like, I love that. Like, I mean, that, well, again, is a sense of community that, like, you're, you're, you're finding in the wine shop. Yeah, and again, I, I, and, I, and I know we've all expressed, like, our thanks for you, like, doing this in such a global experience like it's been such a great opportunity to like bring me through that like for all of us like I'm so thankful that I've had this opportunity to like reach out to people and be like oh this is what I like this is can you help me with this and like to be able to do that now yeah <laughs> I hope this was helpful I'm really like hearing all the feedback um this is great thank you thank you yeah. yep yeah and like yeah. just so moving forward <laughs> some things um like, I'm, I'm looking at doing uh, a little, like, you know, having other guest speakers on, um, maybe doing a little cooking thing um, so you can learn, like, what to pair with things. So it's all sorts of, like, craziness going through my brain. So one day at a time. <laughs> yes. No, thank you. Let us know how we can help. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Cool. You did a great job, oh, Nicole. We'll see you thank next you. week.